Hello and welcome to this 12th Geopolitical Economy Hour, the fortnightly show on the political and geopolitical economy of our times. I'm Radhika Desai. And I'm Michael Hudson. And today we are joined by Anne Pettifold to discuss an urgent issue of our time, that of the third world debt crisis. Uh, as we record this, uh, this is the topic of the summit on new global financing pact called by Emmanuel Macron in Paris. And we couldn't find a more authoritative guest for this show. And Petifor does not really need any introduction, and I'm only going to give one to remind ourselves of the range of her contributions. She's a prolific writer on issues relating to debt, finance, and development, and is also an activist uh, and has uh, intervened in politics to great effect. And John uh, launched the Jubilee campaign for debt forgiveness for the poorest countries at the end of the last century, earning the support of the likes of Pope John Paul II, Muhammad Ali, uh, Tony Blair, Bono, Gordon Brown, and Bill Clinton. She served as an advisor to the prominent British Labour Party figures such as Margaret, Margaret Beckett in the past, and more recently, between 2016 and 2019, she was an advisor to John McDonnell MP, who was shadow chancellor when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader of the Labour Party. Then in 2021, Anne was appointed to the Scottish government's Just Transition Commission, chaired by Professor Jim Skier of the International uh, Inter or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the first government to prepare for the green transition. Uh, in, 20, uh, sorry, in 2006, moreover, she had authored the very famous book, The Coming First World Debt Crisis, which predicted the 2008 financial crisis well before uh, anyone did and at a time when every, no one expected the crisis. Anne is also the co-author of the Green New Deal in 2008, which was subsequently adopted by the social justice Democrats, such as Alexand Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others, as a major plank in their uh, election bid. Um, and of course, since then, it's been more widely adopted as well. She's the author of many books and articles, uh, including Debt, the Most Potent Form of Slavery, um, and the Production of Money, how to break the power of bankers. Uh, right now, Anne also has a substack. It's called System Change, and this is going to form the basis of her new book on the need to transform the international financial system, uh, uh, both for, uh, for uh, social justice as well, of course, as ecological sustainability. So welcome, Anne. Thank you very much for that very generous and lengthy introduction. I'm really grateful to you. Well, I Happy think to be our... here. Great, thank you. So uh, let's uh, let me just say a few things to to frame what we are going to discuss. Yeah. Um, in the 1980s, of course, the world experienced a major and very consequential third world debt crisis, which began when Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico declared that they were unable to pay their debts following the Volcker shock. And then they were followed by many Latin American and African countries. And the effects of this financial crisis marked the world for, for at least two decades, if not more. There were repeated reschedulings, which only resulted in ever greater flows of finance going from the third world to the first world in the opposite direction to which most first world countries say is happening. That is, they say we, the international financial system exists for, to transfer uh, finance from the first world to the third world. The opposite was happening. Practically every major third world country in the world was put under a structural adjustment program, which uh, uh, restricted government expenditure, devalued their currencies, uh, uh, massively increased their, uh, uh, increased their exports, and so on. And this resulted in two lost decades of development. There was massive income deflation in third world countries. In many countries, there was even economic retardation. That is to say, economies shrank from one year to the next. And meanwhile, the first world was flooded with extremely cheap exports from third world countries. This was the reason for the extremely low inflation in first world countries. Um, and of course, the volume of exports grew while the value of exports did not either, either did not grow or actually declined. 
Now, the new century seemed to bring some relief. There, were, uh, uh, there was increased lending from first world countries to third world countries. There was also increased equity investment in the same direction. The IMF and the World Bank, which had essentially acted as the bailiffs for the private financial corporations who had lent to third world countries in the 1980s and 90s, began to lose clients as more and more countries in the third world realized what they were doing and began to have options. So, so they essentially, uh, 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 the, the, the portfolios of these institutions began to shrink. Um, and this was an era of considerable third world growth, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which also marked the weakening of the imperial system of the West. But then after the 2008 financial crisis, you saw a new turn taking place. Financial flows abroad began to reduce, growth began to slow, commodity prices began to fall. Third world countries' products, whether they were primary commodities or cheap manufacturers, fell, trade slowed down. And to that was added the pandemic and then now the Western sanctions and, and other measures in its proxy war against Russia, which have reduced massively or which have increased massively the burdens on third world countries in terms of rising uh, prices of commodities and so on. So this has brought on fears of a new debt crisis. So are we going to uh, see a rerun of the gr uh, th great third world debt crisis of the 1980s? Are we facing two more lost decades of development in third world countries? another strengthening of the dollar system on the backs of vast flows of capital from third world countries to first world countries, another data, decade of low inflation on the backs of third world producers who are forced to work harder and longer for less and less returns for their labor and products? Or is there a difference between then and now? Certainly one big difference is China. And there's absolutely no Western commentary on the, th on the current debt crisis, which does not somehow finger China as the real cause of it. And, uh, and therefore also the cause of the West and the world's inability to resolve that crisis. But clearly there's something much more complex going on. So what is it? What's the real story? Today, Anne, Michael and I hope to unravel it for you by asking the following questions. What is the genesis of the 1980s debt crisis? Uh, uh, what are the causes of the debt crisis today? Uh, are third world countries responsible for their own plight, as is, the, is implied by so much dominant discourse? Has debt been turned into an instrument of uh, uh, world power and imperialism? Is China putting third world countries into a debt trap? What does the debt crisis have to do with the dollar system and what is the way out? These are the questions and perhaps, Michael, uh, we will start with you on the first one. What, do you, how, what, what are your views on the genesis of the debt crisis? Well, we're seeing the end of a long process that was dysfunctional from the beginning and was bound to lead to widening economic polarization and crisis. Uh, today's international financial rules uh, were set in 1944 and 45 by the U.S. geopolitical strategists, and they designed the World Bank and the IMF in a way that served America's uh, creditor position at the expense of Britain's position and uh, the world's former colonies uh, and at the expense of countries that were debtors uh, because the United States uh, from the very beginning used its creditor position to exert control over uh, debtor countries. That's what creditors are able to, to do. Uh, I explained all of this in my book, Super Imperialism, uh, at the outset, so I'm not going to go over that here. Uh, but uh, to be specific, the World Bank sought to steer the global South economies into dependency on US food exports and other products. The way the World Bank was set up, it could only make foreign currency loans, not domestic currency loans. And yet, uh, for third world countries, uh, now we call them the global south, to develop, they needed domestic spending in, in their own currency. Uh, the United States uh, uh, essentially said, well, we're really only going to lend to finance exports. Uh, we want uh, you, most Latin America and Africa, were told to export plantation products. The one thing the World Bank told that would not lend for was for their own domestic food production. Every uh, IMF mission said you, you have to do 
what America has done with its agricultural system, provide agricultural services, marketing agreements, uh, uh, rural education, uh, seeds. Uh, the World Bank said none of that. If they produce their own food, then they will compete with American exports. We want them to produce only goods that America doesn't produce uh, and let them all compete with each other to lower the price of uh, debtor country products so America can monopolize the price of predator country products, mainly food, manufacturers, uh, and high technology. So from the, uh, needless to say, this forced countries into balance of payments deficit. And that's where the IMF came in and said, well, once you have a deficit, you're going to have to devalue your currency unless we make you a loan. So we'll make you a loan, but uh, you have to uh, uh, somehow uh, agree to compete with other countries by putting the class war back in business. You have to uh, be more competitive by uh, lowering wage rates because after all, world prices have uh, the same prices for raw materials, for machinery, for credit. When a country devalues, it's really devaluing its labor. And uh, the IMF started a process that's now gone on for 75 years of uh, continually lowering the exchange rate of third world labor uh, to make it cheap for American investors. And of course, uh, by imposing austerity, this didn't really help them pay their uh, debts at all. It made them even further in debt. And then uh, the IMF said, well, you have to privatize uh, and sell off your uh, raw materials, your mineral rights, your oil rights, and your public infrastructure to foreigners so that they can, uh, by buying out uh, your means of production, uh, that you can use these dollars to pay the foreign debts that you've run up by following our bad advice. So it was a losing game from the beginning. And that's why uh, in uh, 1982, uh, Mexico announced that it couldn't pay. And oh, behind all of this was uh, starting in 1953, uh, the CIA began overthrowing governments that aimed at land reform, starting with Guatemala. Uh, the, there was a decision made that countries uh, starting land reform uh, are inimical to the United States, and you had U.S. government interference uh, in, in other countries to sort of force them into what uh, became known as the Washington Consensus, and it was all self-destructed and destructive. And uh, that really began in 1972, and it was obvious that uh, there was going to be uh, uh, the breakdown. And uh, I was a I worked for Chase Manhattan Bank as their balance of payments economist, and in the mid 1960s, I was asked to look at the balance of payments of Argentina. Brazil and Chile, how much could they afford to borrow uh, to repay as a market? And I could see that they couldn't afford to uh, take on any more debt. They were already loaned up before the big crisis uh, came up. And so there was a meeting at the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve told the banks, we know that they can't pay, but we will simply uh, lend these countries uh, the money to pay their foreign debt. We will call it foreign aid. And if you look at the American foreign aid, uh, a lot of the foreign aid increasingly went to uh, debtor countries to pay the U.S. banks. It was a circular flow. And uh, the solution to debt was yet more debt. They borrowed their way out of debt. And uh, finally, that uh, uh, reached an end in uh, 1982. And uh, uh, that really became uh, the debt crisis that exploded. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anne, uh, that's that's really great, Michael. So, Anne, please go ahead. Well, I would agree with a great deal of what Michael has said, but I think my orientation would be slightly different. Um, I absolutely agree that the U.S. has been using its imperial powers since since the Second World War, um, perhaps earlier even. Um, you know, to control, if you like, uh, resources for the United States uh, at home and abroad. <clears throat> but I would take a different orientation. I would argue that instead of putting the United States in there, I would put Wall Street in there. Instead of putting the IMF in there, I would put Wall Street in there. And Wall Street, in my view, is responsible for much of the mess that the world finds it in at the moment. Now, let me begin at the beginning. I'm a Keynesian. I'm a Keynesian monetary theorist. And I believe that Keynes is far more radical than he's ever given credit for. Credit for. He believed in a form of a liberal socialism, if you like. Um, and he's often defined as being exclusively 
concerned with fiscal policy, tax and spend. But he was actually overwhelmingly concerned with monetary policy. It's, after all, the general theory of money, uh, interest and, and employment. <clears throat> and money and interest come first. So um, in 1919 at the Versailles Treaty, he's in the negotiations. He's a young economist and he's struggling uh, to get his voice heard. But he's also overwhelmed by the tragedy of, of Europe in 1919. He's working strangely with the South African um, president at the time. And he's uh, uh, the look, they, they're traveling across Europe and seeing the devastation. And he comes up with the idea that actually the problem for Europe is the system. Wall Street financed the First World War. And he believed that Wall Street would not or finance the recovery, or if it did try and finance the recovery, it would do so at very high real rates of interest, for which you could read real high rates of return. And so he proposed instead that there ought to be public provision of credit for Europe for the recovery in 1919. In other words, he proposed that the United States, Britain and France should issue a bond, a promise to pay, of, I think it was about a million pounds, a lot of money in those days, which would go to Germany and be used in recovery, and Germany would repay pay that bond over time. He, he, pr he proposed the same for Eastern European countries. Now, what we did not know at the time was the United States President Wilson was accompanied uh, by a Wall Street, a big shot from Wall Street, who drafted the letter of rejection to Keynes, uh, in the name of, the, of President Wilson and said, thank you for your bright idea, but really we don't want it. <clears throat> he was so disillusioned with that. In, but what he was proposing was system change. Rather than Wall Street financing the war and the recovery, he wanted uh, to use public authority to raise the finance needed for recovery in Europe. He was defeated hopelessly. Um, he then struggled on. He wrote... Uh, the uh, economic consequences of peace in a fit of very bad temper and some of it is very personally insulting uh, and you know the, it's not a perfect it, but it's a text that's never been out of print right and he sort of gave up after that didn't give up but he would despair and then uh, Britain by mistake fell out of the gold standard in 1932 and then in 1933 Roosevelt is elected as president and on the night of his election Roosevelt decides he's going to dismantle the gold standard. And he was, proposes to close the banks on the Monday after. And he staff said, and he wants to cl close the banks then, and that, that Saturday night, on the night of his inauguration. And he staff said, you can't because it's a holy day tomorrow. You can't do this. So you do it on Monday. And whereas most people think of the closing of the banks as, as a reason for saving the banks, in fact, it was a reason for dismantling the gold standard. And banks were instructed to hand over all their gold to the Treasury. And indeed, the public were invited to hand over all their gold. And gradually, he moved the dollar of gold. And he began to fiddle with the value of the dollar, in, in fact. Anyway, the, the, he, he's, no, he's not perfect, as Roosevelt. He made some big errors. He even decides to reverse course in uh, 37 and embark on a period of austerity. So, you know, there's, and of course, there's an awful lot wrong with what Roosevelt did. And he was racist or he complied with the racist norms of the Democrat Party. And he was a bit of a misogynist. He didn't include women in, for example, his, his camps for growing trees and, and helping with the nature's recovery. Um, so there we are. So then in 1944, Keynes goes to uh, uh, Bretton Woods and, and, and is defeated by White uh, and the, the president's representative over the issue of who will control the world's reserve and how will you manage the world's reserve currency. He proposes an independent bank with a, a clearing bank that would operate, if you like, above and beyond individual states and not draw on the imperial power of a single state. And he's defeated by the Americans who want the dollar. And, and the reason I'm telling this tale is to disagree to an extent with what Michael is saying, because it's the power of the dollar that is the problem. And the dollar is part of a system uh, that is generating vast, vast amounts of both private and public debt, which are unsustainable. Um, 
and and th this is uh, this has been done in cahoots with Wall Street and also of course with the Saudis although that that deal seems to be breaking up the petrodollar so um so the point is this you know I campaigned long and hard to get a hundred billion dollars of debt cancelled for about 30 of the world's poorest countries in nominal terms and that's small beer really uh, but nevertheless, it was an achievement. And in 2005, I worked with the Nigerian government and we cleared $30 billion of debt for Nigeria under a finance minister in Gorzi Okonja Iwala, who is now head of the WTO. The fact of what, what I learned from that lesson is that cancelling the debt is a, a shallow process. It's something that can be done. But so long as the spigot of debt is still t turned on, the tap is still flowing, and as long as the, the debt is, I mean, a large proportion of the debt today of low income countries is due to the strength of the dollar. And the dollar strengthened, number one, during the great financial crisis and number two, during the pandemic. So whenever there's a crisis and even when it's caused by the United States and is located in the United States, the dollar strengthens. Right. And automatically uh, this affects the exchange rates of poor interest poor countries and and elevates their debt. And so I'm I'm at the point where I really don't want to talk about debt cancellation, although of course it's either going to be cancelled or defaulted or paid down. Those are the only choices we have. I would rather talk about changing the system. So because it's this and I mean I felt that throughout the Jubilee 2000 campaign. When we were campaigning for debt, I mean in the process I began to realize look, you know, you can cancel the debt, but it won't Break this. It won't break, if you like, the the, the circularity of the system. Um, and so I began to argue that we should have an independent debt negotiation process between creditors and debtors, similar to an insolvency process, where an independent judge judges whether or not the the lend the creditor is as guilty as the debtor, and if so, that the losses should be shared. We don't have such a system, so the the burden of losses always falls on the debtor, never on the creditor. The creditor in international in the international sphere, not in the domestic sphere, but in the international sphere, is always the beneficiary of a default. Is always backed up by state resources. So um so I tried to get that that process through and to, for a minute uh, in two thousand and one to three the IMF went along with the proposal for a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, mainly because they were mired in the, me the mess that was Argentina and was their creation. And they thought that Anne Kruger, who was at the time the number two at the IMF, thought that would be a way of extricating the IMF from that mess. Uh, but that was defeated. I went to a conference in 2003 at the IMF and was invited to speak. And that proposal came up. It was defeated on the one hand, by Wall Street, which was well represented. I had lunch. I was at lunch table with Paul Singer of the Vulture Fund, Elliott Associates. But most importantly, by the finance minister of um, Mexico, who is now the head of the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, and whose name escapes me for the moment, who said, I'm sorry, I don't want to upset my creditors. Mexico loves her creditors. We want more creditors. <laughs> And so I'm not going to support this. And because Mexico was such an important debtor and was so influential, uh, it was agreed that the, the whole idea should be scuppered, and it was. Now, there have been attempts to go back on it, and there have been dribs and drabs of here and there. But fundamentally, the a balance of power between international creditors and sovereign debtors has not been altered. But what has happened is we've had crises, and this has worsened the sovereign debt crisis. So I hope that's not too long. No, no, that, that that's really great. And and I just want to add uh, uh, just a couple of thoughts to that, because, you know, the question is, you know, what, what were the origins of the debt crisis of the 1980s? And I would say the debt crisis of the 1980s was the first crisis of the post-1971 highly financialized dollar system. Because if you think about it, if, you know, as I think, Anne, you rightly remind us of Keynes uh, and, 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 and what he proposed at Bretton Woods. And I really feel everyone should study those original proposals because by studying them you realize just what's wrong with the system that we have right now because Keynes's proposals were based on promoting balanced flows whether of trade of fine of capital etc whereas in reality and whereas by by rejecting that 
where, and yeah. essentially, I think Annie also said something else very important, which is that um, at Bretton Woods, we are often told that Keynes lost and White won. But actually, all proposals for a sensible international monetary system, which would not unreasonably empower any one state, which would not rely on imbalances, were rejected by the a treasury department by the u.s government etc and yeah. so they 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 so, so 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 the point is that and of course the 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 very imbalances that yeah. the u.s system produced the dollar system produced in the post-war era led in, directly to its uh, um to, to breaking the link <coughs> in 1971 because yeah. of the triffin dilemma the united states ran deficits in order to provide the world with liquidity and the greater the deficits were the the less valuable the dollar became and so the system was unsustainable and so the gold link was broken but then what happened is that in order to counteract the triffin dilemma essentially by the counteract the effect of the u.s deficits on uh, on the dollar what the united states did is vastly expanded financial activity and that uh, expansion of financial activity increased the demand for dollars for financial reasons, not for productive reasons, for speculative reasons and predatory reasons, but they increase the demand for the dollar. And essentially, since then, what we've seen is periodic expansions of financial activity in one form or another, yeah. which have uh, kept the dollar system going. And so you can see how ruinous it's been. So to me, the debt crisis, both then and now, is the yeah. result of the imbalances necessary for the dollar system to function. So in the case of the 1980s, essentially what you have is a situation in which the United States essentially uh, 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 in order, you know, in the turmoil that followed the uh, uh, collapse of the, the 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 gold link and everything, what you had is the rise in oil prices, and then the United States persuading the oil exporting countries to de rather than creating an IMF supervised facility that might have helped the oil importers, they said, you know, you please deposit your oil surpluses in our financial institutions. So I these. I think they threatened. <laughs> they threatened, exactly. They threatened, they cajoled, and they managed to get uh, yeah. essentially dollars uh, which were earned by the OPEC countries to be deposited in Western financial institutions. And then, of course, if the Western financial institutions saw this tsunami of deposits, they had to lend. And so the, in the 1970s, these financial institutions went on a lending spree. They yep. lent to third world countries, to even communist countries. Yep. They essentially became uh, touts of, of loans, you know, borrow from us because they had to earn interest if they were going to pay interest. And mm -hmm. in the 1970s, therefore, there was essentially a, a kind of, you know, the, 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 the balance of payments restrictions on third world countries' developments were lifted. Third world countries could borrow money essentially practically free money because in the 1970s as well you were going through an era of neg negative real interest rates very often so these mm -hmm. countries borrowed and they were financing their industrialization which was actually undermining the united states relative dominance of the world economy as well so by the end of the 1970s you get a a, a, a major event that puts a stop to all this that that is so the volcker shock the 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 decision of the federal reserve under paul volcker to allow interest rates to rise as high as they would rise you know they at one point they even went up to 20 percent in first world countries forget what they did in third world countries in order yeah. to to quell inflation but also in order to restrict the power of labor in first world countries and restrict the power of an increasingly assertive third world that was demanding fairer terms a new international economic order and all these things so the volcker shock essentially interrupted all this and then uh, as you rightly say in the uh, debt crisis that followed the reschedulings and renegotiations that followed the principle which is that there is creditor co-responsibility for adjustment for for dealing with the debt crisis was completely eliminated and debtor countries were made primarily responsible for for the debt crisis so in, in that sense i would say that this was the real origin of the third world debt crisis and then it was resolved by essentially like i was saying earlier through structural adjustment programs which 
promoted lack, you know, de-development. And that's the other thing about the international financial system, which caused the 1980s crisis and has causing the current crisis. And that is that essentially the money, you know, debt can be a force for good. Uh, mm -hmm. Credit can be a force for good. It can finance development. But essentially, mm -hmm. on the one hand, the IMF and the World Bank impose policy priorities, which are actually de-developmental. They yeah. do not permit countries to undertake the sort of investments that are necessary to, to create development. So first of all, they remove the possibility that developmentalist policies can be followed. And then they lend for essentially debt repayment or, you know, just to keep going, etc., to keep going a system that is designed for subordination to first world countries. So this is the real origin. That is to say, it's not just that there is debt, but the debt is designed to be of the worst kind, not developmental and, and, and so on. So I think this is, it's that's to me, some of the main points that we should establish. And I also, by the way, agree that in this process, it is private power, Wall Street, that mm -hmm. is really the, 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 the driving force behind these. Wall Street needs to lend in order to earn money from third world countries. And that is why they do everything in their power mm -hmm. to ex, you know, expand such lending, whether the uh, countries may need it or not. And, and then, of course, when there is a crisis, the governments of first world countries essentially end up backing Wall Street and, and getting the, you know, so making sure that they do not lose from their own irresponsibility. Mm, right. Uh, so would anyone like to add anything before we go to the next crisis, which is what do you think is the, uh, is the cause of the crisis today? Perhaps we can talk about that. Uh, Anne, would you like to go first? Yes, I mean, I, 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 yes, I want to say that the things, you, you know, the things moved on. I, I first of all want to say that total debt, uh, public and private, as far as I can tell, it's quite hard to get the actual numbers here, is about $300 trillion of debt. Global income is about, is, is around 90 to $100 trillion. So we have, you know, just twice as much debt as we have income. And so we know those debts are never going to be repaid. But the proliferation of debt is no longer something uh, that is a feature of the, 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 the main street or the high street banking system. It's now a feature of the shadow banking system. So Wall Street has both, on the one hand, led to the privatization of assets across the world. Um, and privatizing those assets has enabled massive surpluses and savings to be accumulated by the asset management funds, the private equity funds, the insurance companies, the pension funds, and so on, that operate in the shadow banking sector. And they uh, they engage in a form of credit intermediation um, and, uh, and, and, and so forth. And as a result, um, they are actually becoming the creators of new credit but beyond the regulatory boundaries of, the, of, of democratic governments or undemocratic governments for that matter. So we now have these massive amounts of debt. We have huge quantities of financial assets in the hands of these corporations managed mainly by Wall Street. And we have, if you like, the deregulation of markets. And one of the reasons we have a crisis at the moment, and by the way, the Falker shock, the Falker shock was a consequence of Folker's very low interest rates prior to and, and his highly accom accommodative process towards the towards Wall Street. And there's a wonderful book I've just had recently. I was trying to look at its title. I think it's called Lords of Easy Money. Yes. It's, about, it's by an, a, a monetarist, a right-wing uh, ex-central banker, who argues that he created the conditions that led to the build-up of uh, inflation i.e. too much easy money effectively, and then clamped down them. And, and in the process, both created the crisis and then destroyed, nearly destroyed the, the American economy. And that is such a reverse of the story that we get told. And what's so awful is that we've seen that process reproduce itself, you know, as we live now. We had this long period of very low rates, highly accommodative, uh, monetary policies towards the shadow banking sector, the bailout of the shadow banking sector, which after all was the cause of the 2007-9 crisis and had to be bailed out again. 
in 2018 and in 2020 at the height of the COVID crisis, 29, 2020, yes, and um, and is basically guaranteed and, and backed up by central bankers. So we have two big to fail banks. We have something called pri private equity, which by as Caroline Sissoko has argued, is neither private nor equity. Not private because it's backed up by two big to fail banks, which are in turn backed up by taxpayers. And then their, their investment is not therefore private and it's not equity, it's debt. Um, they used to be, you know, they used to have a very different uh, a branding. Um, they used to be basically debt creators and, uh, and they've just rebranded themselves. So we have... So we have this deeply unbalanced and unstable system, which I know is going to collapse. I wish I knew when. Uh, everyone is quite now really worried about commercial real estate and the fact that A, there's people are working from home and B, uh, the value of these properties are falling. And we know that massive amount of debt has been leveraged against these finite and, and, and limited assets. So they daren't rent out their buildings at less than the going rate because that would indicate that the value of that collateral is lower and would, would automatically increase the value of the debt. So uh, that's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, and that's why Silicon Valley went down. So the corp these commercial uh, real estate guys are hanging on to their real estate. I walked down Bond Street the other day, which, as you know, must be the wealthiest street in the whole of London. The number of voids was quite extraordinary, the number of empty buildings. And what they had done was put fancy... Uh, posters up in the windows make it look lively and interesting but it was clear there was no business going on behind those posters they will not rent out those buildings to at a lower rate to artists or to any other kind of business that could afford to move into and would love to move into Bond Street because doing so they would admit that the collateral that they held had de de declined in value that would increase the demands of creditors for repayment of that debt and so they're sitting tight this, this this is going to break quite soon. And the question is when. Um, if we knew, we make, could make a lot of money out of it. But anyway, so we've, we're reproducing the Volcker crisis right now. Today, our central bank has hiked up rates again, which is a form of sadistic economics in the rich countries. Never mind what it'll do to the poor countries, because what it'll do, it'll worsen the strengthening of currencies like sterling and the dollar these high rates of interest, and money will flood out of, for example, the country of my birth, South Africa, towards the city of London and towards Wall Street and weaken those currencies and therefore increase their debts as well. So, um, you know, I feel as if we're going over this all over and over again, but this time the scale is greater than it's ever been. And and that can be, that could be finally be the final, the, the final straw it seems to me. But who knows? You know, these these institutions are immensely powerful. They're not back. I mean, the, 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 the uh, Michael will back me up on this, but the U.S. Congress is effectively in the hand, you know, has been bought by Wall Street. So they have immense political as well as and therefore military power. So, you know, the idea that they are going to be damaged or lose money might seem uh, from someone like me to be just uh, delusional. Mm -hmm. But um but the fact of the matter is the cost of uh, maintaining this incredibly unstable and unbalanced system. And, you know, just to come back a bit, Radhika, to what you were saying about Keynes' proposal, Keynes proposed that he, you would penalise both those with surplus uh, accounts as well as deficits. You would say, look, you don't build... China should not have a surplus. Germany should not have a surplus. And, and the United States should not have the deficit that it has. So he would have insisted that they ought to, and that would have required a certain amount of discipline. But of course, you know, the United States wasn't going to have that. Michael. You are at length yeah. about this, I know. So. Exactly. Michael. Well, what Anne spoke about in both her comments was the ability to pay. How should debts be brought within the ability uh, of countries to pay? And yeah. uh, if they can't pay, is it a bad loan or is, is the debtor at fault? Uh, the creditors demand that debts be paid regardless of the effect on society. Uh, and this uh, intransigence of uh, uh, creditors is uh, what's 
the basic underlying cause, which is uh, what we're discussing. But there are also particularly causes right now. Uh, and just mentioned the rising interest rates uh, at the U.S. That raises the dollar's exchange rate. So yeah. a foreign country per, uh, owes, uh, has to earn the money to pay in mm. its own currency. And yeah. uh, it costs more and more of uh, a peso or another uh, local currency to buy the dollars to pay the debts. Uh, countries uh, should only owe the debts in their own currency because at least they can always print the money for that. But if they owe it in a, a currency that's rising in value, then the uh, amount that they owe keeps going up even more than the interest rate. So that's partly it. Uh, uh, Anne blames uh, Wall Street, and I always want to uh, point to what the government's done wrong too. And certainly the US government has uh, uh, given a shock to the economy that is as, as bad as the Volcker shock, and that's the anti-Russian sanctions. Uh, these sanctions against Russian oil uh, and gas have increased world energy prices. So all of a sudden, the debtor countries have to pay more for their energy, uh, which uh, the U.S. Uh, diplomacy is based on control of the oil industry. Uh, food, uh, uh, gas is used to make uh, fertilizer and fertilizer prices have gone up. So uh, food prices have gone way up. That squeezed uh, the uh, the debtor countries. And the problem is that uh, these countries owe more than they can possibly pay. Well, uh, what Anne suggested, you need some kind of international uh, judge to say, how do we bring the debts back into uh, line with the ability to pay? This is uh, fought against not only by Wall Street, that obviously it wants to collect the debts no matter what. It doesn't care about uh, the effect on the third world countries, but the United States uh, has been uh, imposing these rules uh, because it says the more Wall Street makes, the more the U.S. economy makes, and that's what gives us our world diplomatic power. Uh, the, the fact that other countries owe us dollars give us the ability to do any uh, U.S. diplomacy we want, including the military diplomacy of running an enormous balance of payments deficit uh, for military reasons that's all financed largely by uh, the creditor position of the United States extracting the money uh, from the global south. So, but, uh, but Michael, yeah, Michael yeah. Can, sorry, could I just interrupt you? Because the thing about this, I mean, one of the... Um, the most striking things about the Roosevelt administration was that they understood that they were moving the government from Wall Street to the Treasury Secretary's office in Washington. Yeah. Now, you know, that was an admission that the government was owned by Wall Street. And I would argue, Michael, that Wall Street owns the American government. So, I would never disagree I, with that. <laughs> I, I find it hard to make the distinction there. And can I just say, I think you and I are going to differ on Russia because I think Russia did invade Ukraine and, and territory, blah, blah. But what I'm very clear about is that it was absolutely unacceptable for the United States to freeze Russian foreign uh, Russian reserves. That is that you know that is a great right. public good. It is a, it is the asset of the people of the of Russia. You know, it's not even one of their exports. It is their, one of their public goods. And it's like freezing the sanitation system of a country because you're going to war with them. I mean, that is was totally unacceptable. And that has led to this major uh, uh, realignment, ge geopolitical realignment that's going on that will harm the United States, I think. Yes, uh, that's harmful. the silver lining of all of it. The one <laughs> silver lining is that this has finished the, uh, yes. the idea that dollars are safe. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, no, I think that, you know, I think we agree absolutely on that. And, okay. uh, and, and I, I mean, so what I don't understand, is, so here am I again, I'm saying Wall Street owns the government. So let's, I want us to call out Wall Street here. If, if only because Wall Street so often just gets away with this, you know, they like to be invisible. The shadow banking system is invisible. Nobody, it's very hard to explain to the woman in the street, mm -hmm. look, there's a shadow banking system. Did you know about, can I explain it to you? You know, it's out there in the stratosphere and I'm sorry, you can't see it, you know, and your government has, out and out. but it becomes very real as it has now when global commodity p prices go berserk. Now, I've had a real battle here in Britain to assert that we have inflation not because wages are rising un, un, uh, unreasonably. And this government is hell-bent on a class war. Hell, and so is the, the, the governor of the Bank of England, right? 
when and nobody talks about global commodity markets which are you know transactions are dealt with at the chicago mercantile exchange so everyone says oh the war in ukraine and everyone says oh president putin put up the prices he has no power he's the russians are victims of the price of oil yeltsin never had the kind of oil revenues that Putin enjoys at the moment. He never had the power that Putin has at the moment. The Saudis don't fix the price of oil. It's, and furthermore, the price of oil is not a factor of supply and demand, right? Because what happened was there was a brief a brief, a, a choppy up, a cut in demand uh, supply because the war started. But very quickly, the Americans started... Uh, downloading their oil reserves and and grain appeared from other parts of the world and supply and and demand evened out it took time and there were supply shocks i'm not denying that but the fact of the matter is that was not what re was reflected in the price it was the speculation that the, the 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 price of those essential commodities would keep rising that a wall of money and it's all that shadow banking money and asset management funds in pension funds in insurance companies in private equity funds, aimed at Chicago, aimed at the global club. And our, our governments and our economists refuse to talk about those global markets. And when you explain to people, sorry, the market in your, uh, in, in, in your energy is not determined here, or supply and demand, it's got nothing to do, well, it's, it's got something to do with the war, but it's largely to do with speculation. And this was brought home to me, if I could just quickly tell you a story. Um, because I'm on the Scottish Government's Just Transition Commission, we went to the Outer Hebrides, to the Isle of Lewis, to look at a community-owned turbine, uh, a wind turbine. And it was a really impressive community. I mean, they had borrowed money from a Spanish bank, Santander, because the Brits wouldn't help. And they bought, spent $15 million, I think, on this huge turbine which to get on the island. With, they had to rebuild a road to get a blah, blah. And then, and then now, and they, and the they're allowed to not give money that from the, that uh, the the production of that energy to individuals, but they can provide it to the community. And then we interviewed the citizens, Stornoway of the island, and we said, "What do you think about all this wonderful wind energy?" And they said, "We hate it. We hate it because we have these enormous turbines in our back gardens, but we do not pay the price of that cheap energy. They're able to generate energy almost for nothing. They feed it into the grid, and the price of it becomes the price of the gas price fixed, a global price, right? And so, so, so while we have this cheap energy on our doorstep, we are paying a global price for energy." And that brought home so clearly that these markets have nothing to do with what's going on in our countries. They're global. And who are they managed by? By speculators based largely in Wall Street and Chicago. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to explain here at home the link between the international and the local. And I think this is exactly, you know, the point is that essentially, you know, when you when when and you say Wall Street runs things and then Michael yeah. says it's the government. Yeah. And then you rightly point out again that, and we all agree that the American government is in the pockets or, or is, in a, is in a pocket of Wall Street. Okay, all this is great. And what is their purpose? What is the overall purpose of their foreign policy? It is to create a world that is as dependent on the decisions of private capital as possible. Yeah. Yeah. That is to say, they are not allowed to do th what this little island did, which is yeah. exactly what all third world countries should do, is actually to, to, yeah. to, 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 to create their own productive power in, yeah. and through developmentalist policies in a way that makes them independent yeah. of the, 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 the web of uh, uh, financial transactions, which is basically now what American capitalism amounts to. And yes. so, so, so this is the thing, but I, I just wanted to bring us back a little bit because I think we'll probably have to end on this question, but let's just fully discuss the specificity of the current crisis. It's different from the 80s crisis and more generally it's imbrication in the international financial system. So I would say that I'm of course many superficial similarities to the current crisis versus the previous crisis. One of them is, you know, 
know, a period of easy money followed by a period of higher exchange uh, interest rates and, and, and so on. There is also the role of the Federal Reserve, the usual IMF, World Bank stuff is going to go on. But there are also important differences. I would say that one really big difference um, is the following, that in the 1980s, what happened is that the United States uh, and the uh, Volcker shock essentially were aiming to put an end to what had been a very uh, impressive and extremely genuine spurt of third world development. And mm -hmm. today what we have is a situation in which um, after sort of collapsing in the early, uh, in the latter part of the 19, in the latter part of the 20th century, International lending was revived. A lot of it took place under private auspices with securitized lending and, and so on. And, uh, uh, and, and, and then what has happened is that the 2008 debt crisis, the, 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 the uh, sorry, so, so, and th this lending took place. However, it took place in a context where after Two decades, you know, 80s and 90s and into the 2000s, decades of structural adjustment policies, neoliberal assault on developmentalism. It, this money was being lent to countries that had already bought into neoliberalism in a substantial way. So this money that was lent did not have the same developmental effect. Yes, many third world countries grew during this period, but it was thanks to a benign period for the prices of uh, third world resources in particular and so on. So the current debt crisis is actually coming uh, is is going to be in many ways more costly because it's not coming after a period of healthy development etc yeah. so so yeah. that's that's another very important thing and then a third really critical difference is that you know in both cases you know both debt crises came at the end of challenges to the imperial system because to me the most important <laughs> challenge you can make to the imperial system is pursue successful development and uh, you know of course imperialism has sometimes to be fought with guns but i think the most important weapon against imperialism is development. And today what we see is that China in particular is in the forefront of having been able to develop. And it has been developed, it has developed precisely because it has shielded itself yes. from the effects of the international, uh, of the system of international governance whose prime yeah. purpose is to impose de-development to keep third world countries less yeah. developed. So it has yeah done that. And by the way, one thing we haven't mentioned, you know, has done that to, through various means, but that includes capital controls. We have also come at the end of so many decades during which uh, the lifting of capital controls was the holy grail uh, that was pursued by the, the U.S. government. So the presence of China, not only as an important developed co developing country, but also as now a major lender to third yeah. world countries is another big difference. And this debt crisis is going to look uh, quite different because it's taking place in a context where the presence of alternative sources of finance, principally China and to a lesser extent the BRICS, institutions that are being created and other multilateral institutions that are being created. So these are some of the key differences as I see them. Now, the resolution of this crisis is going to be very difficult, uh, particularly in the uh, aftermath of the pandemic and then the current crisis created by sanctions, etc. I would say that uh, this is going to exact a huge price from yeah. third world countries and some kind of initiative is needed to deal with it. But I think that the international atmosphere to create any sort of initiative that benefits third world countries is extremely fraught. So I just wanted to put those things yeah. there. So, well, uh, yeah, go ahead. Anne. I agree with all of that, but I would say there's one other big difference, and that is the ecological crisis. Yes. In order to repay these debts, those countries are going to have to strip their forests, they're going to have to fish their seas, they're going to have to degrade their land, they're going to have to exploit their people. And the more they do that, the more they degrade the eco ecosystem, not just for their own countries, but for the world and for the United States. And it's that blind spot that you can't go on extracting and extracting wealth from the poorest countries in the world without hurting yourself without hurting Americans and without hurting Western nations, that hasn't fully dawned on the IMF and on all those powers that be. That is a huge new development. It's not a new development. It's been there a long time, and it's been an issue since the beginning of time. But, but now it's a, a crisis point. And at this point, to demand 
that you know and that for me is the big problem with debt is that it requires extraction of real assets in order to be repaid it is itself as as soddy frederick soddy argued a mathematical concept but the repayment of debt requires physical extraction of assets and it's that which is not possible it's just not possible it's not going to happen and if it does happen god help us all and i think it's that failure to understand that grave grave risk that and it's not as if the ecosystem is going to collapse it is in the process of collapse already we're there you know we have here in what they call an insect apocalypse i count the number of bees on my garden i think i've got four right this is a crisis for uh, for 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 for, our, for nature uh, and for our survival for human survival and you know we know the seas are warming and we know there are going to be more floods and there's wildfires in Canada Radica not far from where you are i mean this is crazy and in that those circumstances to demand further extraction of earth's finite assets seems to me suicidal essentially absolutely michael well, go ahead uh, yeah i think you're right about the uh, characterization of the crisis and the question is why can't the world deal with it? Well, yeah. uh, we're back to the question you raised at the beginning. What's wrong with uh, Wall Street uh, taking control of government? Uh, yeah. if, if, uh, it, and it's the, the financial sector lives in the short run. If, if the financial sector in Wall Street took a long-term view, wouldn't it help? To avoid global warming? Wouldn't it help to have uh, the uh, third world countries and the global south develop? Of course it would. But that the financial sector lives in the short run. They only care about three months or at most one year. And so uh, the, the crisis that you talk is a world crisis over time. And Wall Street says, wait a minute, our crisis is three months from now. This is not going to problem with three months from now. We want to get paid. Uh, and we want to get paid by, I'm sorry, you're going to have to cut down your forest to pay because that's what you owe right now. We're talking about the difference between short-term and long-term perspective. And that's the problem of Wall Street. Short-term perspective, you'd think that the government can take a long-term perspective. And as Radhika just pointed out, that's what makes uh, China uh, in a strong position because the government runs the, the central bank instead of the central bank running the government. So this this story of the submersible, you know, seems to me yes. to so so to symbolize the idea of billionaires that they can defy the laws of nature, <laughs> and and sink two and a half miles down or go out like Elon Musk into the stratosphere, and survive. I mean, it's that delusionalism that you exactly. can defy the laws of nature. Anyway, no, they have exactly. Their own and laws. Yeah, I mean, and I'm so glad and that, of course, you, you, you mentioned the climate crisis, because I also see that there is a deep connection between the climate crisis and the crisis of what what I call neoliberal financialization. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, neoliberalism is always regarded as sort of free markets, but actually neo, what neoliberalism, the only thing neoliberalism could amount to in our time. Uh, at the particular stage of the evolution of capitalism was financialization. And, you know, as you guys were talking, I was reminded of a book that actually came out, I think, in the 80s. I could be wrong, maybe in the early 90s by Elma Altfater. And he uh, this was, a, 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 you know, it was, it was an, actually entitled The Future of Socialism, but it was about many things. And uh, and he pointed out, you know, made the same point, I think, very well in that book, which is that the problem with the shift to finance is its short termism, because any capacity to deal with uh, 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 climate issues, ecological issues requires a long term perspective, which finance simply does not have. And uh, uh, and by the way, you know, uh, uh, well, anyway, that, that's another point. But, you know, Marx also said uh, at the beginning of the section on rent in volume three, he said, with private ownership, you cannot have a rational agronomy, which is to say a rational way of dealing with the land, of managing the land and so on. And I, I think he was dead right. But, you know, so so and and, and the, the what I want to add to that is that if, you know, we all talk about people talk about degrowth as an important uh, solution, and I'm not disagreeing with what they mean. But I do yeah. want to take a little bit of issue with what what the words they are using. I agree. Because, I agree. You see, because because the thing is, if you actually look at a chart of world growth, um, uh, chart of world growth descends actually uh, after the onset of neoliberal policy. So the world yes, is growing less exactly. fast. The neoliberals but, are the best degrowthers in the world. That's right. So they have actually already imposed <laughs> degrowth. But every index 
of uh, ecological destruction, whether it is climate change, pollution, yeah. loss of biodiversity, you name it, every in the index is actually rising steeply only after 1980. So actually, the less growth has gone side by side with the spoilation of nature, the, the, the absolute rape of nature, pr yeah. precisely for the reasons I think that both of you have mentioned, which is that the financialization actually involves the the abuse of all the resources of the earth for the privilege of a tiny minority. Exactly. And this is the financial system that we have created. And this is the financial system that has caused this new debt crisis as well as the old one. Uh, however, we are nearly uh, at an one hour limit. So what I would suggest is that we should end for now and pick up this discussion. We have we, all, we are only at question two and we have five more questions to answer, including the critically important question of what is the solution? And we have already hinted at it, but it deserves fuller discussion. So I think what we might do is end here. If both of you wanted to have any quick say, uh, please do. But otherwise, we can end here. And uh, we can pick it up next uh, uh, next fortnight when we, uh, 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 you know, we just continue this discussion next fortnight in a second part. I think that's great. And no, I don't have anything to add. I think it's been a really fascinating discussion. So thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. And that's just been your just a great addition to our, our usual uh, natter that, that Michael and I have. So that's great. And uh, so thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank you. And thanks to Michael. Thanks also to our videographer, Paul Graham. And we'll see you in a fortnight. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.